surprisingly quite different than I expected. I came by a cruise line. I flew out of Bombay to Rome. I'd never flown in my life. Raising family in a foreign country is not that easy, especially when you believe in your cultural values. But if you take a human being, mentor, polish, nurture, educate, value add is infinite. The discipline of marketing needs scholarship investment. And that's how the idea of came to start the Seth Foundation. In India, we need a scholarship in marketing, research in marketing. So we started a association called Academy of Indian Marketing. You know, I think, I think how do we become a most admired nation? My view is that it happens through its people. Hi, everyone. My name is Anita Sharma, and I welcome you all at Inquartum Media once again. Today, I'm speaking with a person who is a peripatetic scholar, change agent, advisor, entrepreneur, and scholar philanthropist. His seminal work on the buyer behavior is one of the most and must read papers in marketing management seminar courses. Trust me, this is actually a fan moment for me. And I'm feeling super and super elated to welcome Professor Jagdish Shet. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting my request. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, sir, I was reading your uh, work and uh, I, I, I'm so happy to learn somebody who about somebody who has gotten more than five decades of experience. You have, you, you have gotten 55,000 citations. You have written more than 300 research papers, 30 books on various disciplines and topics. You have worked uh, with top universities of the world. And then recently you received in 2020 uh, Padma Bhushan Award, one of the highest civilian awards given by the government of India. And I happen to read your autobiography, The Accidental Scholar. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I traveled through your journey. It was so mesmerizing and engaging. So in these 50 years which you have worked, uh, you have gone through and I'm sure you must have witnessed a complete paradigm shift in almost everything, the culture we are in today, economy, businesses, way of working, almost everything. I have a philosophical question. I'll start with that. So the first question to you is that if you look back and reflect, how would you be able to define your life journey in one statement, the philosophical perspective towards your life? Sure. Um, one of uh, being blessed by the environment, uh, by the family on the one hand, but by different cultures. Mm. Uh, that's the only only thing I can think over 50 years is how much have I learned from where I was, how much I've been able to contribute back to the society, especially academic, but also community, etc. And how much family has mattered a lot to me. Raising family in a foreign country is not that easy, especially when you believe in your cultural values and you have a strong belief system that our Indian philosophy and the values that we give to run a household or a family is quite good. So preserving that value in a foreign environment and still doing a good job managing the transition, all of that when you reflect back to our 50 years, the only message is that how blessed you are. And every evening my wife and I both comment on that one, how blessed we are after 59 years of marriage now, Next year will be 60th anniversary. And both of us think about where we were and where we are today. So that's the main thing I think about. Uh -huh. So uh, we all have American dreams. India Indians generally believe that uh, most of us have American dreams. Uh, so let me take you through your memory lane. And uh, I would ask you the next question, which is around the day when you landed in America. How yes. was that first day in 1961? Surprisingly, quite different than I expected. Uh -huh. I came by a cruise line. I flew out of Bombay to Rome. I'd never flown in my life. And from Rome, flew to Naples. And from Naples, I took a cruise ship. The nine days on cruise ships were more interesting because all the students from different countries uh, were in one Cuban uh, compartment, I guess, or one bunk beds. It was cheap flight for the chief cruise right. line because I couldn't afford anything. And it was interesting to meet different people, different cultures. 
the ship had lots of uh, American high school children returning back. Mm. And I'm a little older, so I was just watching, observing their behavior. But once I landed in America by the ship, two things happened. In India, especially South India, where I grew up, you always have a habit of reading the paper in the morning. Mm. The cruise ship came in the morning. So I went to the person on the dock who was selling newspapers and everything else. And I said, I want my newspaper. So he gave me a whole pile of newspaper, very thick. I said, no, I just want one copy, not 50 copies. He said, no, this is the newspaper. I could not believe her. Okay. And I kept that newspaper. <laughs> yeah, I kept that newspaper for two weeks thinking that obviously there'll be recycling. Somebody will come to my host family and we'll collect and get some money for that one as we do in India. Huh. You know, you knew rags and you know, newspapers. It didn't happen. So that was my first impression. My God, this newspaper is so much. How can you read so much in one day? Uh, I had a host family in the University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So from New York, I flew TWA again to Pittsburgh. And he came to receive me. Mr. Charles Dexter was his name. Uh -huh. He was an automotive component maker. Mm -hmm. And he took me to his house in a car. Again, cars were unusual for me because I grew up in India and in Chennai where cars were not that great. We just had ambassador at best. So seeing fancy cars was a big one. But he had a very good uh, sort of a farmhouse, as we call in India. Uh, near the airport, uh, and uh, I stayed in their house. Uh -huh. so that is my first memory, uh -huh. landing in uh, Coriopolis or Pittsburgh. Or something okay, like that. okay. Sir, in your book, uh, The Accidental Scholar, you mentioned about Professor Bernard Bass. Yes. How that uh, incident shaped and helped you to design your research career? I would like to know about you know, the incident because it is mentioned <laughs> in the book. Right. Um, I... I did work before I came to America for one, one and a half years. I had worked in my brother's business, which was making jewelry boxes. Uh -huh. And so we had to deal with customers. We had to deal with employees. We had to deal with, you know, uh, everybody, essentially. And I always was fascinated about what motivates people. So when I went to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was a very good university. I got a complete fellowship that I didn't have to pay one year MBA, so I can save my living expenses, which I had to borrow money. And uh, he and I just got along. Professor Bernard Bass was relatively young, one of the more famous professors in his time on leadership, mm -hmm. management side, not marketing side, on management side. And he had a scale created called SIT that managers tend to be self-oriented. What is in it for me, my career? or interaction-oriented, they love to chit-chat with their employees and peers, or task-oriented, get jobs done. Mm. And he had a classification. <clears throat> and I liked the scale, the way it was designed. And I told Professor Bass, you know, this is also true of customers. Maybe we can measure the same thing. Some customers might be selfish, what is in it for me? Mm. Some love to chit-chat when they go to a bank or when they go to a patrol station. And some say, let me just finish my tank. Mm -hmm. or let me just get my transaction and out of the way, task-oriented. He liked the idea. Okay. So how we began to work together. Uh -huh. So that's how our journey began. He was a very well-known professor of management. Uh -huh. So first of, first thing you did your MBA and then you uh, decided to do your yeah. PhD. Why you um, shifted your thoughts towards research? Uh, everything I can attribute to one class and one person Huh. In MBA class, in your first term or a second term or three terms, you have to take compulsorily classes in behavioral sciences. For the first time, I got exposed to psychology. And one author's writings that I read in my textbook was Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. It struck a chord. It's almost like Bhagavad Gita, almost like a you know, Bible or almost like Quran, something that revelation. I said, this makes sense. This is what people are all about. So oh. I got so excited that I decided to actually change my major when I decided to do my doctoral degree to individual and group behavior or behavioral sciences. My minor was social psychology and my applied field was marketing, mm -hmm. understanding psychology of customers. Maslow's need hierarchy, I did something with it as a part of my paper for the class. I felt coming from India, 
and more a macro thinking at that time as opposed to micro behavioral, uh, that what he talked about as the individual hierarchy and growth is equally applicable to nations or institutions. So I said that when the people are primarily at the safety survival level, the institutions have to say, I will protect you. So if you take religion as an institution, the only appeal you have to make is that guards will protect you. God loves you has no meaning to people at that time. But once those safety survival needs are satisfied by unionization, by government protection, how will you do it? Now you move on to love and affection. So you have to say God loves you. He resonates with people. Mm. Once you pass that stage and go into uh, self-esteem and independence, now you have to change your appeal to say God is with you. You are in charge. Mm -hmm not the temple, not the priest, not the institution. And ultimately, when you are self-actualizing, which is what he mentioned last stage, you have to basically say, God is in you, not with you even. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So religion, religion has to appeal differently to different segments mm -hmm. in the society. So I said that in India, people are still survival mode, you know, safety, security, job security, daily living, etc. majority of the people so the appealing of God loves you has no meaning. They go there to say, so we pray for safety, survival. But in America, we are going way beyond that one to saying God is with you. And by the way, that is happening. This is 55 years ago. Today, you can clearly see that there's a whole Easternization of the world taking place now where more and more people in the Western advanced societies are searching for meaning in life. And they're looking within which is what Eastern religions are all about. Our Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, all of them say for to search for meaning in life or understand suffering, look within. True. And now it's becoming mainstream. So I'm told that 6 million American or uh, European Christians are all practicing Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Spirituality. So the Easternization spirituality is the first. Yoga has come in now. You can think about that one. Mm -hmm. Yoga day is practiced by all the non-Indians even more religiously than we practice. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to see True. while at one time there was a westernization of the world, now there's an easternization of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was an interesting book which I read long back while my MBA, uh, Western Doors, Eastern, Eastern Doors, Western Windows. So it was all about the same thing that mm -hmm. uh, when we started following and believing in Western world, now we are bringing back that philosophy right. towards ourselves. So um, right. I would like to know about your PhD thesis, uh, because yes. from psych psychology aspect, you shifted to shifted your uh, thoughts towards marketing. How did that happen? Uh, by accident. Uh -huh. uh, back to Professor Bernard M. Bass. I would have been his student, he would have been my advisor, but I needed extra money to invite my fiance to marry me. I could not go back to India to marry. So I told Madhu, my wife, can you come here and marry me? In order to invite her to get my dependent visa, I have an F1 visa student, F2 visa as they call it for the dependent. I had to earn $400 per month in those days, minimum. Uh, my compensation or stipend from the school for a PhD was only $287.50. Mm -hmm. I needed extra money. And that extra money, Bernard M. Bass did not have a grant. And out of sheer accident, it was a marketing professor, John Howard, mm. who had the money. He somehow liked me. And he said, I'll be happy to support, give you extra money, work mm. for me. Mm. And that's how I got into marketing. Nice. Uh, there are so many incidences around uh, the, the <laughs> University of Pittsburgh and how Pittsburgh was sinking during those days and how yeah. you managed your... A uh, comprehensive exam, then your thesis. It was really <laughs> amazing to read your book. Um, yeah. um, so uh, fast forward uh, 40 years, I would like to know yes. about your um, AM Shed Foundation. Did it happen exactly yeah. or did you plan for that? Uh, it was semi-planned almost. Mm -hmm. You know, coming from India with our tradition of always giving back, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you are blessed by the society, and I always believed in one thing that I've been saying more publicly, that if you take a grain of wheat and make it into a loaf of bread, agricultural commodity, 
the value add is only three times. If you take a rough diamond, a good diamond cutter will polish it and the value add will be about 15 to 20 times between the market value of a rough diamond versus the finished diamond. But if you take a human being, mentor, polish, nurture, educate, value add is infinite. And I'm one of them. I'm a refugee from Burma before World War II. When Japan rolled over, we just had to leave everything. What you see happening in Afghanistan or in Syria or in Vietnam War, or whatever it is, Korean Wars, same thing. So given that situation, there's always this inclination to give back. You are blessed. Somebody nurtured you. Somebody gave you all the breaks or all the, you know, all the opportunities. So the thought was always there to give back, which led to the start of the Sheth Foundation. And the question is, where do you give back? Do you give back to your community? We all like to give back to our temples and our religion. I felt very strongly that the discipline of marketing needs scholarship investment. And that's how the idea of came to start the Seth Foundation. Mm-hmm. And uh, Seth Foundation will now celebrate 30 years, surprisingly. Time has flown by. And it's 1991 when we incorporated primarily at one time to support University of Pittsburgh, who had given me so much. So I wanted to give back wow. scholarly work wise. And University of Illinois, where they had given me a great job opportunity, where I excelled in terms of learning everything, administrative leadership, uh, policy committee leadership, teaching. I mean, everything I did there, it was a place where I just grew so much as an academic. Wow. And then, of course, American Marketing Association. So that was the idea originally. But then we shifted to primarily focus. We gave enough comp- and our, um, endowment to Pittsburgh and Illinois to do the other things. But we started focusing on four major academic associations. Mm-hmm. And that is the Shet Foundation. It does many, many activities. But the most important activity is a doctoral consortium. It is it, it, it funds. It's hosted by different universities, and a hundred top doctoral students come, one per campus. It's the next generation of scholars, and about hundred to hundred and fifty top scholars come. A university will host it. In mm-hmm. two thousand twenty-one, it was hosted by Indiana University. It was previously hosted by Leeds University, Northwestern University, all bid for it. New York University, and interestingly. They meet together, and so one generation invests in the next generation's producing scholars. Mm-hmm. That idea has done very, very well. It does many more things. But then we, so my view was that in India, we need a scholarship in marketing, research in marketing. So we started an association called Academy of Indian Marketing. And that is the one that does the same thing. We have a doctoral consortium in conjunction with the AMA. Seth Foundation funds that. We provide research grants also, one lakh per grant, and it's about six grants. We apply, people apply for that, and we select there's a jury committee, etc. And it is doing quite, quite a lot to primarily motivate our Indian scholars to say teaching is great, mm-hmm. but the world is no longer teaching colleges. You are more at a university now, so research is equally important. Mm-hmm. And if I can publish in top academic journals, you can publish it also. Mm-hmm. Given, given my background. So we motivate them to say, aspire to publish in top journals, not only for your career, but taking a pride on being an Indian, which is what has driven me. How can we become the most admired people in the world? Mm-hmm. That we contribute back so much in scholarship or in charity philanthropy or in public service or in being, you know, ambassadors. Or I mean, I'm talking about uh, not ambassadors, but, but but cabinet ministers, as it is in Canada or in England, same thing in America now. You know, I think I think how do you become a most admired nation? My view is that it happens through its people. Maybe it's products, brand names, but people are the true ambassadors. And that has always driven me. And I feel like we all Indians can do a great job in contributing back to the society on a global basis. Mm-hmm. And therefore, a top scholar from India if he or she is very reputed, gets a Nobel Prize in other disciplines as we do in economics, for example, mm. as we do in sciences, how can we do the same thing in the business discipline? It's a very um, noble and uh, thoughtful initiative which you have uh, made for uh, Indian scholars as well. Um, you have um, 
I F I M. The school has changed the name uh, yes. as Jagdish Shet School of Management. A professor Philip Kotler calls you a Renaissance man. How does it feel? All all people, um, whatever is happening for you around you with you. How does it feel now? When you look back, 